Thank you for joining us today for the fourth session, this April session of our executive forum. We will be starting shortly. Welcome everyone, I'm Denny Brennan, the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Health Data Consortium. And I'm excited to welcome you to our April edition of the Road to Interoperability. Before we introduce you to our forum co-chairs and our guest experts, let me go over a few housekeeping items. Today's session will run an hour, but we've appended 30 minutes at the end during which MHTC staff will stay to answer any questions or to continue conversation on a topic that you find of particular interest. This is a forum, and as a forum, we expect and encourage participant engagement. But because we're only an hour, we plan to be ruthlessly focused on sticking to our time frame. So please raise your hand, unmute your mic, and let us know what you think. This meeting is being recorded and will be available on our website within a day for MHDC members only. This form is free for MHDC members, but if you're a non-member organization visiting us today as a guest, we do have a registration fee uh, for the executive forum for the remainder of 2023. Following today's session, there will be a Zoom survey that will pop up and ask you a couple of questions we appreciate your feedback in helping us to improve our webinars and this forum to the best extent possible. Now, let me introduce our co-chairs for the 2023 Executive Forum Series. MHTC board members, David Caruso from Point32 Health, who is our board chairman, and William Young from Berkshire Health System. Gentlemen. Welcome everyone. Good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, 2023 forum series. I'm David Caruso. We are delighted to continue the longstanding forum with a new focus on broadening our community, engaging industry and government leaders and providing dynamic educational experiences for our members. We look forward to seeing you throughout 2023 and hope those of you who are not MHDC members will join our consortia. We're very pleased to get on with today's forum. I'm turning it over to Bill, my co-chair. Take it away. Again, good morning, everyone. I am Bill Young, and I am the Chief Information Officer at Berkshire Health Systems on the western side of Massachusetts. I am excited to have you here today with us and uh, also incredibly excited to have our, our speakers, Melanie and Brett, uh, both experts in this space of interoperability, You know, a word that we've been hearing for quite a while but continues to play strong in our industry. You know, these folks are going to talk about some things that are incredibly important and have great expertise. Da Vinci, Fire, USCDI, HL7 in its new formats. And I think if you all ask them some questions about chat GPI, we got to figure out where that comes in next. <laughs> but with that, I turn it back over to Denny. And again, welcome, everybody. Thank you, uh, Dave and, and William. Um, let me introduce our guest experts. Uh, Melanie Combs Dyer has represented CMS on the DaVinci project using FHIR to improve interoperability between providers and payers. Melanie retired from CMS in 2020 after 30 years where she worked to reduce improper payments in the Medicare program. Melanie is now the Director of Innovation at Metal Solutions, which is an 8A firm that builds and operates the CMS original Medicare FHIR server for prior authorization requirements, documentation, and decision, otherwise known as PAR D. Brett Marquard is an industrial engineer who brings systems thinking to all of his projects. He is an expert in V2, his first love, the clinical document architecture, CDA, and FHIR. Brett is the primary editor of the Argonaut Data Query Implementation Guide 
and the corresponding HL7 US core. He is the project manager for Argonaut. Welcome, Mel and Brett. Thank you for joining us today. Let's now, before we uh, proceed, provide you a little bit of an overview of how our forum works. We will be asking our guest experts four questions. And then we'll be, after each of those questions, we'll be turning those questions back to you as our forum members for your comments and inputs. But before we do this, uh, why don't we ask Brett to share a little bit about the fundamental design and data structures for interoperability, starting with the US CDI. Brett, hey. take it away. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Melanie, today. Uh, with Hims next week, I thought, you know, it'd be interesting to pull a few slides to, to before we move into these uh, great questions to give a little bit of background and level study for folks on US CDI and US Core. Um, so the first piece here is there's, you know, uh, HL7 develops these implementation guides. And one of the kind of key implementation guides out there to enable ONC's data policy is uh, US Core. And so this standard, this takes the kind of core HL7 fire standard and uh, provides explicit profiles, uh, kind of terminology and guidance on how to implement it. And so your allergies, your problems, your medications, your kind of top value data elements that ONC has identified through their policy committees are built into uh, this standard US Core. We've had several versions of US Core over the years. Uh, and so actually included here is a direct mapping to the US CDI to help developers find, hey, here's the kind of technical artifact that goes with the policy piece that ONC has provided. Um, and there's a link here if anyone wants to check it out. If you haven't found it for your, your development team or if yourself, you wanna uh, uh, take a peek at it. There's lots of examples in there. We try to make it as readable as possible, but we know we're standards at developers and we know sometimes it's uh, it's not the, always the most accessible thing, but if you ever, uh, you know, uh, find a piece that's unclear or you'd like to prove it at the bottom of every single page is, uh, you, know, it, you know, actually post a tracker or post a comment that we actually process and try to make it kind of continuously improving it uh, to make it as accessible as that we can to the kind of developer masses. Um, a teeny bit on history. We get asked about this a lot. Um, this, you know, for folks who watch the US CDI that ONC has published, we did kind of two releases on version one because we were trying to improve the language. And it, of course, when something goes into regulation, it gets lots of attention. Uh, and so with that, then we improved the guidance in the 4.0 release. We've had two new releases since then. And I don't know how, uh, how closely, we, you know, we joked a little bit internally about the uh, ONC's latest proposed rule, which came out 48 hours ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's 500 pages long. I, I'm not sure everyone has had a chance to read it all. But searching for keywords in there, one of the pieces ONC did note for US Core is uh, they plan in the final rule to actually name the 6.0 release, assuming it's published in time. And so that they're looking to kind of drive the entire industry uh, to US CDI version 3, which is great because it's, it's, it's kind of raising the floor of what all health systems in, in the country uh, need to support. Um, so one of the things you know, folks ask us in the standards community again about this kind of US Core UCA relationship is, does US Core uh, the standard directly equal what ONC US CDI is? And it's very tricky because when ONC publishes their day policy, they'll say, you know, we want to do patient goals or we want to do social determinants of health assessments, um, but they don't necessarily go to the detail to say, hey, you need to have a goal date or you need to have these specific elements, and so. So that they don't quite line up a hundred, you know, they're not, they're not a perfect match. And one of the other ways they're not a perfect match is the timing isn't perfect either. Um, and so we kind of have this kind of in our internally, we joke around that say, Hey, anytime we do a new ballot age of seven, we add a bunch of, you know, we add not only what ONC has recommended, but the implementation community can come forward and say, Hey, we want to exchange this particular piece of data. It hasn't been, it hasn't been noted by ONC. Um, we'll add it to US Core. And a really simple example of that is patient encounters, you know, the visit. That wasn't in the original version of ONC's US CDI. All the EHR vendors and technology vendors we work with said, hey, we're used to capturing and exchanging encounter. So we made an agreement in the standards community to add it. So we're not 100% driven by ONC's US CDI. But over time, ONC keeps releasing these new rules. 
and raising the bar with USCDI, which is very exciting for us. Um, but each time they do that, USCDI has a little bit, you know, uh, more things than U.S. Core, and so the cycle right now, if you want to, you know, make a note to yourself, right? If, you, if this isn't ingrained in you, which I hope it's not, because it's not, you know, you have probably more important things to worry about. But every summer, every July, ONC has committed to releasing new versions of U.S. CDI. So this July, you know, get your party hats out. Sometime middle second week of July, ONC will publish U.S. CDI version four. Uh, it looks like they may add imaging. You know, if you're curious, they've already proposed, they put what they proposed as the new things in there. Um, but the standard isn't done. Like we haven't even, the standards work hasn't even started on that USCDF4. We've given some feedback to it, but the standards process will go kind of in the fall and there'll be an official HL7 ballot in the January of next year and then publication kind of in April, May time frame. And so there's kind of this lag time when OMC said, here's the policy direction taking some standards input, but then to formalize the standard, do some testing with real implementers, get some really good feedback, uh, takes uh, not quite a full year, but but almost. And so we're kind of always jumping back and forth. And so I, we, I kind of joked with um, the also, you know, ONC about, we're always playing this game of leapfrog where we publish the standard and then a few months later, they publish kind of new requirements for us. And we're kind of continuously jumping over uh, each other. And so we're excited that US Core 6.0 will be published in a few weeks. Uh, but of course, we're looking for that frog to jump right up back over us uh, this July. So anyway, that's a little bit of level saying on US Core, US CDI. Uh, you know, happy to take questions there, but I know uh, we have uh, some really good questions uh, for the panel. Any questions from members of our audience as to Brett's I think extremely helpful re re review of U.S. Core vis-a-vis -vis U.S. CDI. All right, why don't we go back to our questions? Um, as I mentioned, we have four questions, and we're going to start with one. And Mel, I'm going to ask this question of you first. Sure. It might seem obvious, but we haven't had data standards before, or, or there have been data standards that we have not used or have disregarded until this point in time. Why is it so important to have these standards that are used consistently by everyone? Um, in my opinion, the main driver, the main reason that we need to have standards in any industry is to meet consumer needs. If you think back in history to when the railroads didn't all have tracks that were the same width or train wheels that were the same width apart, the goods would have to travel on one train and then stop where there was a transition to the other train and all the goods would have to be offloaded to the, to the next train. And then it could go on its way, delaying um, the delivery to the end consumer. Um, the same thing happened with cell phones. Um, those of you who are old enough to remember when you had a Verizon phone and you could only talk to Verizon people or an AT&T phone and AT&T system, AT&T cell phone provider and you could only talk to AT&T people. Um, that wasn't very helpful. The consumers wanted to be able to talk to everybody, no matter whether they had a Verizon service or an AT&T service. And very quickly, the industry moved to allow cell phones to work for anybody that you want to call. Um, the, the banking industry and ATMs went through the same kind of thing. Um, and now I think we're um, in healthcare and we, I, I believe, need to continue to develop new standards and improve standards. Um, to meet the needs of the end consumer. Sure, there's lots of work that providers have to do. Sure, there's lots of work that payers have to do. But the reason that we're doing it all is for the patient. Thank you, Mel. Brett, what is your perspective on this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's like, you know, we use the word friction a lot in our word. Like, how do we reduce friction? Um, and part of that is, you know, you know, we are, I you know, think about like as in, uh, you know, an engaged consumer, like, you know, we have the, uh, in terms of our own health, um, we're the biggest stakeholder in our own health. And part of getting access to that uh, across all these organizations is, is having standards. And, you know, you can rattle off the things that go with standards of like, you know, you know, you know, potential for, you know, stronger quality reporting you know, potentially lower costs with duplicate, you know, no duplicate tests. You think about, you know, I don't know. How, I just moved from Western Massachusetts uh, to Minnesota. And it's, you know, uh, you know, for 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 Western Massachusetts, and I, I, I realize Bill knows Western Massachusetts really well, the, the some of the rural healthcare out there, I hadn't realized how 
many different clinics had their own little kind of um, labs and they really they didn't exchange cross kind of health system within there because they're kind of little private practices. And so coming to Minnesota, uh, uh, it's interesting that there's this massive, large integrated health system and I, it's um, and, and they've kind of put the standards and pieces in place. And so as a consumer now, um, I am able to get access to this and it's uh, it's a mix of kind of lack of standards and the kind of a lack of, uh, uh, you know, energy and, you know, the cost to, to get all that information flowing. And so, uh, yeah, it's, there, there's just, there's a, there's a lot of pieces, but I, I'm all on board that, you know, to meet the consumer, to improve patient's health, uh, you got to have standards. Let me add one more point um, I, on this topic. I was in the room in probably 2017 and 2018. Um, maybe in 2019, when there were lots of discussions going on uh, in CMS. I, at that time, was um, finishing up my work in the Center for Program Integrity, where we ran the prior authorization programs for original Medicare, and moving into the Office um, of uh, Health Benefits and Interoperability, OBRHI. And there were discussions about the prior authorization um, and fire regulations and what would be in the first NPRM and what would be in the second NPRM and how are we going to get to interoperability and almost everyone around the table started with the vision of what's it going to be like for the consumer for the patient when when the data is at their fingertips so that they can do um, what they want to do they can um, request information from payers they can um, move things between um, one provider and another provider um, we knew that we couldn't get there all at once. We knew that CMS was going to have to start slowly and um, do it in piecemeal and give plenty of time for providers and payers to um, uh, come into compliance. But everything started with the vision of the patient. In fact, um, the administrator at the time, Seema Verma, had a, a, a public saying, I guess the marketing people helped her come up with it, called Patients Over Paperwork. And it sounds like a cute little, um, you know, little, little, tagline, but she really believed it. And those of us who were sitting around the table really believed it too. It, reducing the paperwork burden for providers was good for providers, but it was also good for patients. Um, and and um, so that's why I really think that um, consumers really are the ones that we have to keep in mind when we think about um, the importance of having standards. Thank you. Um, let's turn this back to our audience and get some perspectives from folks who are joining us today. Uh, those of you who have a, a, some insights that you would like to share with us about health data standards, uh, please unmute your mic or raise your hand and we'll, we'll be pleased to hear what you have to share. And I will start calling on willing or unwilling suspects um, as we move through the meeting to help us get comfortable with doing this kind of back and forth. Bill, what about you? You're in the middle of a, a health system in the western part of the state. You're looking at standards. You're looking at your electronic medical record. What does this mean to you? You know, and and I actually see one of my one of my favorite doctors out there, Doctor Tui. I may ask him to join me, as you say. Let's call on the participants. Um, you know, I, I boy, we need this. It is such a critical aspect of what we need in healthcare. You know, for Melanie and maybe Brett, the, the question I put back to you is the data we're getting right now in many of these standards can be overwhelming, right, for providers to sort through. Um, so the, the good and the bad, right? It's great to know that as we send our patients to a, a bigger tertiary healthcare next to a space state and they come back to us and we get this great amount of data, but it's hard to sort through it. It's hard to see the valuable data. So what do you think come, comes at us soon that's gonna start helping us there? I'll start on that one. I think that um, there will be smart on fire apps um, and other um, types of uh, sort of tailored technology that can help um, on the payer side for the, what, the overwhelming um, batches of data that they're getting. Um, as well as for providers to help them, as you said, uh, handle the overwhelming batches of data that they get. Um, apps that can pick out, the, um, probably using implementation guides that have yet to be created, um, picking out the valuable pieces of information and displaying that to the provider the way that the provider wants to see it. 
Um, so I believe that there's more implementation guides for more use cases that will produce more um, smart on fire apps or um, pieces of the EHR as they exist today that will help um, bring the right data into the front of the, um, the health practitioner's eyes so that they can um, take care of the patient in, in the best way that they can. Thank you, Mel. Brett, this sounds a little bit like CCD versus fire. Um, when I hear people receiving a whole bunch of data that they have to parse and that they have to organize. You're an expert on this. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's a first off, it's for folks who know the uh, five to six million CDA documents will move across the country today. Um, and so it's a it's a big standard. And people, uh, there's a there's a mixed reaction to that. I think most people's reaction is, oh, well, can you please make that stop? You know, that's that's a part of the industry. Um, but there, there's a there's a lot of there is some value being derived out of that that I think um, people have leapt to fire but have missed that the whole life insurance use case is completely changed by being able to get these CDA documents and there's some payment quality pieces that have kind of pulled out of that and so uh, but as Bill mentioned this has become a um, I'm trying to use kind it's funny to use kind words. But standard I've spent thousands of hours on and I feel like <laughs> immense responsibility and guilt about it at the same time um and I've spent time trying to fix it and do pieces but at some point like it's so complex folks it's like this crazy data model that tried to model all of healthcare and then we tried to make it as usable as possible in this package and we just had the wrong wasn't the right tools 10 11 12 years ago Anyway, sorry, I'll get back to Bill's kind of comment, but like the data can be overwhelming. And part of the reason it's overwhelming is what the EHRs are doing is they're basically doing a chart extract and dumping it in the standard. And there's different levels of care each vendor takes when they put it in the standard. Some EHRs, and I'm sure Bill, if you went to your doctors and said, all right, let's look at base state, let's look at Cooley MGH, let's look at some of these things, the quality of how that's organized directly ties to how much the vendor invested in CDA originally. And I can tell you the vendors I've worked with, it's a huge uh, range of some who did like the absolute bare minimum for certification to the, this is our kind of cross organizational strategy for moving data. And so there's like probably a hundred million, I don't know, two millions of dollars difference in investment across that. But, you know, Melanie's kind of like, hey, smart and fire apps, yes. There will be new tools to help process some of this data to kind of pull out the key pieces. I sometimes wonder like the feedback loop and, I, and I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I, and I imagine just how busy everyone is. And I just think like, how do how does that feedback loop improve to say like, hey, you sent me like crap. I don't know how to say this. Like, I don't know how like that <laughs> feedback loop, like if you don't, if that feedback loop never happens, like people, it's hard to improve those things. And so, that is anyway, a great so let me point. try to be more that, specific. Yeah, Go that's ahead. a great point that it's not happening right now, right? That feedback loop, because it's not just the vendors, right? It's how we use their tools, right? And I think we got to get that happening somewhere in our industry that, that with the same tool set, I can put an, an incredible amount of data that some of it's useful, or I can be very careful of how I'm packing the data in. And it might Excellent. be partially expectations too. Like maybe our expectations have been so low for so long because it has been so bad you know, that we're in a new era in terms of like our ability to kind of validate data. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of tooling that's come out and I think will continue to come out in the years ahead that I almost hope that we get like a reset with the clinical community that, yeah, we've made a lot of promises about interoperability the last 10 years and we didn't really, I mean, as a community, I don't think we've really delivered. And I think that I hope that you'll give us another shot <laughs> I mean, and I don't say this is like a consult, I think it's like a broader industry. Like I, there's a lot in the years ahead. I think we, we can do so much better. I have a question um, maybe for Brett or for others. Um, I wonder how much of the, the underlying cause of the problem that we're just talking about here, the feedback loop or the lack thereof between providers and the technology is because we have so few EHR systems that are out there. There's two main big players, and it seems like they can be very slow to um, make change. Do people feel like if there was more competition in the EHR industry that there would be um, 
um, th that the EHRs would be listening better to providers and and um, and consuming that feedback, offering mechanisms to acquire that feedback and and changing to to meet the providers' needs. That's a great question, Mel. I certainly have a perspective on that, which is I think that feedback loop that that Brett you described and Melanie that you're asking about seems to me to be driven in many respects by people starting to have an understanding of the data that they're actually getting. And as a consortium, working with their colleagues who may be competitors in other contexts, but when it comes to improving electronic medical record technology wholesale, there's nothing like having you know a dozen signatories on a letter to Epic or to Meditech or to Cerner who are key customers and who are asking the same question. Um, that's one of the approaches that we think is effective in helping to move these, these, these vendors. I would certainly like to see more technologies, more competing technologies out there, um, especially as it relates to the cost of these electronic medical record systems. But that will be another day, I suspect. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, Melanie, it's a great question about the competition in the EHR community. I mean, I think part of it, whenever I talk to the EHR vendors, is they, I mean, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I look at Bill again, because on my screen here, it's like the number of requests and priorities that the EHRs have for like new sales, new enhancements, new features, like interoperability, it doesn't, I don't, I, we all want it, but like when you say like, could you improve this? It doesn't, I don't get the sense, and, and maybe you could tell me I'm wrong. I'd love to be told I'm wrong, but the sense I get with a lot of EHR vendors is like, the providers scream for other things louder. And so that's where the development resources go. And so I can't, yeah, that's my sense when I speak with them. Brad, I think I think you're right, right? Um, and I'm, Denny, thank you for bringing a, a third a third into the top two, right? I think Meditech is starting to kick that competition a little bit up there. So, um, you know, I do think, and, and again, nudging my doctor down there, Dr. Tui has a list of over a hundred great enhancements to our Meditech system that, that he really needs as a physician. And every week, I think he adds another one as he works with it. And uh, interoperability is on the list, but there's only so much they can do. Right. So uh, I do think, but I actually add to that, that I do think we've got to come up with a way to get communication back to the vendors, but also back to our healthcare partners. Because I think the tools you built can do an awful lot more, even in the systems that we have. And I think if, if we together start to be a healthcare community that's in interacting with how we share data, we can help each other. So. Well, why don't we move on to our next question? because I know we have a lot ahead of us. Um, the second question is, what are the main health data standards you see as essential and what role does each play? Melanie, I'm gonna ask you that question first. Yeah, I, I think of this sort of in historical terms, like I first think about X12, like we really do need to, to, to have X12 there. And if, 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 it, if it weren't there, we'd, we'd be in a mess. Um, X12 is the standard that's used mostly for claims and eligibility checks. And will X12 always be there? I don't know. Maybe it won't. Maybe um, I know I've I've talked to some people who are doing some exploration in the blockchain space about is there a way to use blockchain technology to um, handle claims? I don't know. Maybe someday there'll be a blockchain technology for claims and eligibility checks and X12 will go away. But um, I do believe that X12 is, um, at least for the short run, is probably here to stay. After that, the next um, set of standards that at least I became involved in was when ONC first um, became a, a federal agency and they came out with the Connect and the Direct standard. Um, the Connect standard was sort of... Um, um, like moving PDFs uh, around from system to system and direct was more email-like way to move PDFs around. And I was the person at CMS that took both of those um, ideas to our IT shop and said, gee, CMS, original Medicare ought to have a connect solution for requesting and receiving medical records and a direct mechanism for requesting and receiving medical records. I got turned down on the direct 
it sounded like um, we were having lots of email issues at the time, and it sounded like people did not want to have one more um, email system that they would have to manage. But the the Office of um, of Information Technology did approve me to move forward with a Connect solution, and so we built in Original Medicare the ESMD um, mechanism, the Electronic Submission of Medical Documentation System. And I believe that there are probably lots of other payers who did too, and so. Pay, uh, providers could then use the ESMD system. Mostly it was adopted by um, large um, facilities, hospitals, more than individual um, physicians. Although some physicians um, uh, um, and individual practitioners did uh, adopt it. Um, but the, the downside of that technology was that it could only handle the CDAs or the PDFs. It could not handle the little individual bits and bytes of, of data. And that's when the uh, when the fire standard came about, and pretty quickly after that, um, in in my thinking, uh, came the Da Vinci project. And the Da Vinci project really began to crank out the use cases, and people began to see, oh, prior authorization, oh, patient cost transparency, oh, payer to payer. Um, when a patient is switching health plans, um, this really makes sense. So I think that there's a, a lot that can happen with um, with fire, and I'm I'm really super excited about it. Um, that's sort of my historical perspective of the standards that are out there. I'd love to hear how Brett answers this question, though. Brett, your turn. I really like how Mel went to some of the history of these standards because it is it's funny to look back a bit. Um, and, you know, I always. You know, I, I kind of thought of it completely different, but then I think where Mel ended is where I'll end also, is that like, I think, you know, I think about standards of like access and authentication to data, and then kind of the traditional, like, how do you structure data? And that's where you get into like X12, HL7, CDA, like, what is it like, what's the format look like? And then we always talk about like terminology of like, how do you get your laboratory loan codes and SNOMED codes and ICD and there are a lot of pieces that make standards work. You know, it's like, how do you open the door? You know, what language are you speaking? And, you know, how do you piece this all together? And, you know, it's funny, standards, you know, to jump all the way where Melly started mentioning Da Vinci, like it's been really incredible within the kind of HL7 community of these popping up of these things called accelerators. So, uh, you know, Denny, you know, invited me part of the reason I'm, I'm the project manager for Argonaut. And Argonaut is a community of vendors that kind of started the end of 2014 and 15 with the idea of accelerating fire and OAuth into healthcare and tested smart on fire, developed kind of a core fire API for access. And, you know, it includes the major vendors that, you know, any vendor we've mentioned so far in this call is actually a part of Argonaut. And, it, you know, their kind of mission has been, how do we solve these shared customer problems that we all have and improve kind of patient access and a variety of other use it's just like DaVinci is kind of solving the, has their community on, you know, payers and, you know, all these use cases around payers. And there's ones on research and public health and, and kind of uh, social care areas. And so to me, it's, it's, it's great to talk about standards. And I think in my mind is this call and like, listen to Manali talk about this, like it's the communities around them that make them work. So, it, you know, there, there's always warts and wrinkles in these standards. But like, if you get the right people in the room, you start testing and developing together in collaboration with the vendors and some clinical folks or payment folks, that's what makes them real. And so, and I say that from when we wrote CCDA and we wrote parts of CCDA, I'm sorry, when we wrote the document standard for like, how do you do a progress note? How do you do a discharge summary? We met with like joint commission, we dumped from EHR hospital system and then we like created these standards and said, this has got to be a good fit. Go use it. We didn't iteratively develop with providers and vendors as we went. And so the idea of like developing in collaboration, it sounds so obvious and simple, right? Like, oh, develop in collaboration. Let's build this together. And you get something that gets used. Like that's starting to happen more and more now. And I think that's where you're going to see real change. Well, why don't we take that question and, you know, turn that to members of our of our forum and ask you in your experience with technology and with the exchanging of the sharing of information what health data standards do you see and do you see any gaps or issues in the roles that they play all right why don't we move forward to our next question and we'll keep this conversation going um 
How can the US CDI and the US core best be leveraged to improve the patient experience? You you alluded to this initially, Mel. You know, this really boils down to the, the customer, the consumer, the patient. What other data standards, if any, do you deem essential in this area? Brett, I'll start with you and follow with Mel. Oh. So it's funny to say, what else do I deem essential? To me, it's like, I, I'm still struggling with the workflow around all these pieces, like where I kind of, my brain spins is like, you know, and I you know, appreciate DaVinci's done a lot of work in this prior auth space of like, how do you do the whole prior auth flow? And like, one of the ones we're really stewing on within Argonaut, and I'm curious what folks think about is like, uh, you know, access to my own images. It sounds like I had an instant, you know, everyone has their own health story. And we were in the Argonaut kind of pre-planning for the year of like, hey, what are we going to work on this year? And, you know, the brilliant Josh Mandel from Smarts, like, we got to do images. We've been talking about images for five years. I'm like, ah, images, no big deal. And that weekend, my son, like, you know, ran down the hallway, twists his ankle, you know, urgent care, get an x-ray. And we run home, you know, passing kids, parents, or, you know, life's crazy. So my wife comes home, goes, you know, the radiologist read it, thinks it's broken. Uh, you know, we got to go see a specialist. I didn't get the CD there. Can you drive? Can you go back and get the CD? So my Monday morning, like my first conference call, I'm like, I got to drive 30 minutes each way to get this CD. And I was like, all right. Josh, again, you're right. Like, we got to make this a project. Like, this is, I agree. And it wasn't just me, but then we met with like some of the major PAC spenders. Cause not, this is not, this is the funny thing is like, we talk about the EHRs a lot, but I'm sure there, there's all these different kind of products around this, like, you know, in PACs. Anyway, so to me, for patient experience, it's like any time, there's just all these, there's very, these pain points. You just talk to patients about like, Everybody hates the clipboard, right? We still get that. Like, that's something that we want to go away. There's these things that you just ask people and we know. And so in terms of standards, it's like going beyond the few of us, it's, it's starting to get the workflows that makes people's lives better. That's where I, I get really excited. Uh, I, you remind me of a story, Brett, and I, I can say this publicly because I know she has said this publicly. Um, Administrator Verma had a similar situation, except it was not as lighthearted as twisting an ankle. Um, she was in the airport um, in um, Indianapolis with her husband and two teenage daughters when her husband had uh, went into cardiac arrest and had to be taken to, um, actually, I think they were in Baltimore, and had to be taken to the hospital, but all of his medical records were back home in Indiana. And what a pain in the neck. The husband turned out to be fine. Um, but SEMA had to run around and, and request all the medical records from all of his hometown physicians to be sent to the place in, in D.C. where he was being treated. And um, she really felt the pain that you just experienced trying to, to uh, you know, request the CDs of this image or that image. And it became real for her. And she told that story more than once as we were all working on these issues. Um, two of the, the um, essential pieces that I think are missing um, are orders, like when the doctor writes an order, uh, maybe gives me a piece of paper and says, it's time for your annual mammogram. Here you go. Here's a piece of paper. Take this to, you know, to, to schedule your mammogram. mammogram. Um, or, um, uh, you know, you get a referral from the physician to go see a specialist. Trying to manage that piece of paper that you have that gets stuffed in a pocketbook or stuffed somewhere in the the you know the back seat of the car, and then you forget about it and you don't make the appointment. And then when you do make the appointment, you realize that it's been too long and the order isn't good anymore, and you've got to go back to the doctor and get another order. It would just be nice if there was some way for the patient to manage that instead of having to be the delivery person from the orderer to the place that I've chosen to have my mammogram done or the place I've chosen you know, to be my um, cardiologist, why do I have to be the carrier of, the, of that information? Um, and so I, I am sort of envisioning a world in the future where there might be a patient facing app that would be like a to-do list, a, a patient action plan. It might sort of have the look and feel of a care plan. I'm a graduate of the University of Maryland School of Nursing, so I my brain just thinks in care plans. I think most nurses think in care plans. Um, and and so, but I don't think it needs to be all the pieces and the steps that providers need to to take. 
Um, in this sort of patient facing action plan, it would be, you know, you have this risk factor, you need to have this done. And, um, you know, it, it, the patient could check off the list, the things that they're done and the, 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 the provider and the payer, if, if the patient gave access, could both look in and see what, <coughs> excuse me, see what's going on. I know that there are some um, in Medicare fee for service, there are some payment decisions that are based on whether or not the patient is compliant. Um, you know, we, we don't want the Medicare trust fund to be spending lots and lots and lots of money for oxygen uh, CPAP machines and, and face masks for patients that aren't using them. Um, and so there needs to be that feedback mechanism between the patient documenting that they're being compliant with um, the doctor's orders and um, the payer who needs to pay for that equipment. Um, so I really am hoping that someday soon there will become a standard for orders that would drop into this um, sort of action plan for the patient that would be visible to anybody that the patient wants to give visibility to the provider, uh, a care navigator, uh, the payer, um, you know, their their uh, adult children, who, whoever it is that they want to have access to their stuff to help remind them and help keep them on course as they need to make dietary changes or they need to make appointments or they need to go to physical therapy or even some of the social services, um, you know, to improve their housing situation or, or whatever it may be. Thank you. Uh, questions from our audience or responses from our audience on question number three. Janice. Denny, this is Patty Reed from Stewart Healthcare. Hi. Oh, hi, Patty. Welcome. I, I think the last comment is very interesting because I know that there are some patient portals that will provide some of that. Patty, I think I lost you. Are you still talking? Yeah, I think you're, Patty, yeah. you're losing your computer. <laughs> I'll take um, at least the part of the question that I heard. Patty was beginning to talk about, um, I think, that my idea of having the, the action item list for the patient or the, the um, you know, here's what I've got to do for my urologist. Here's what I've got to do for my gynecologist. Here's the to-do list I got for my cardiologist. And she was talking about patient portals. The problem that I have experienced with patient portals is that I have a different one for each provider. And so I've got to log into my urologist portal, and then I got to log into my gynecologist portal, and then I got to log into my cardiologist portal. And I can barely keep you know, my normal to-do list together about what I'm doing with work and family. And, and then you got to add all these other portals. I just can't do it. I need something that brings it all together in one place probably in the little device that I don't go anywhere without. And, you know, when I'm standing in line at the grocery store, I can look at my to-do list and I can see, you know, what it is. Oh, let me make this appointment while I'm standing in line. Or, you know, when you've got those few minutes, you're waiting for the kid's soccer practice to end, um, you know, do the next thing that's on your list. I, I just think that portals um, have started us in the right direction, but we've got further to go to make it actually work for patients. Patty, have you made it back online yet? She, um, she actually indicated that that was exactly her point. Okay. This is Janice Good. Karen, by the way. And just, but just one other comment with that, if I may, and then I'll, I'll ask a quick question. Um, portals too are not since since the other component that we're going to ask about is health equity. You know, there are lot there are lots of people who, for a variety of reasons, either don't or can't access portals. For instance, most patient uh, most provider portals are have accessibility issues for people who are visually impaired. And or there are people who don't have, uh, you know, who who don't who who aren't interested or aren't as technically savvy who just don't want to use a portal. So there are other other reasons why portal access may not be ideal. Although that goes into other. So anyway, um, these are all great ideas. But to bring things back on the data front, um, are there major areas of um, of care or types of data that 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 you think people care about that? really aren't covered by any of the standards that you see right now? Good question. Janice, it sounds like you have some thoughts on your own about what those might be. Well, I, you know, I certainly think that there are quite a few of them. I think that we talked about one of them a little bit, which was imaging. 
Um, you know, we did a recent deep dive on physical therapy, and that's kind of the world of the Wild West. But every time that we look at specific areas, there's a lot of things where, where that are somewhat common that people haven't really um, looked into, or there's a sort of a generic solution across healthcare, um, but but there isn't any real standardization around the the stuff that gets used day to day within specific areas. So One that I, I thought of is um, scheduling. Um, I don't think there are um, fire standards around scheduling. And I know that, um, you know, when I have to make a, a, an appointment um, with, the, the, you know, I'm trying to check those things off my list. Um, I have to make sure it's between eight and five Monday through Friday and don't pick lunchtime. And boy, if you pick the first time of the day, you're going to be on hold for a long time. So, you know, it's really hard to schedule that in the right times. I wish that there was an electronic way to go in and see what appointment slots were available. And if I had, um, you know, language concerns or transportation concerns to be able to schedule that, you know, I want an appointment with someone who speaks my native language, right? I want um, uh, to make an appointment with somebody who's on such and such a bus line or, or is, you know, has a, 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 an office practice that's set up for wheelchair users. Um, I think yeah. that would be really cool. And I don't think that there are any standards yet for those, but if there yeah. are, um, Brad or Janice can, can, yeah. Bring yeah, me up we've, to speed. We've talked quite a bit actually about the accessibility issues. They're uh, not just, you know, even now it's just maybe there's starting to be some, you know, do you consider yourself to have a disability? And even that itself, um, there's no standardization around what that means. But the actual accessibility features and going way beyond well, wheelchair accessibility is, is definitely a big lack. I don't know, Brett, if you want to comment. Yeah, I mean, a few, your, your initial question, Janice, about standard there. You know, ONC and the high tech, they have like, you know, their, their level two, three, the data lists and lists and lists of data elements that they'd like additionally standardized, which I, you know, I just popped up, you know, nutrition's a huge area, uh, you know, work, work information continues to grow. And anyway, there's, there's huge chunks that are, are, you know, physical therapy that are missing. Um, I'm scheduling, I, you know, it's near, we, we, everything you just described, Mel, it's funny, the Argonauts, you know, about I don't know, four or five years ago, did like a scheduling sprint. And the Argonauts, we sometimes do projects in like a, we go all the way to the standards community, we publish standards, we really drive. And sometimes we, you know, we write a guide, we do some testing, and then we decide where to go with it. And we did a scheduling sprint and wrote some guidance and Meditech did a ton of work and a lot of great work. And um, the other vendors also did, I won't name any others, just Meditech, because I know they're the one who went the deepest implementing that guide. The other vendors also were engaged and did work, but a lot of them kind of had their own um, uh, existing APIs kind of in their own way that they'd integrated with a few vendors. Uh, you know, there are some aggregate scheduling, ZocDoc, there's a few out there that they'd already integrated with. And so there wasn't kind of the market driven or policy driven demand to make that happen. Um, and it's kind of sad for me because everything Melanie described is like, yeah, of course, it'd be great to that. I struggle with that myself with our own family. So I do think, you know, scheduling is a, still a, an, an area that has, uh, you know, a lot of opportunity for improvement. So, Brett, I have a question for you. Thinking about scheduling first and then we can go into other areas, nutrition or any of the others that are, are, are on the wish list. Um, what do you think it's going to take? Do you believe that there will be a groundswell from patients, from um, you know the, the 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 people who need to have the scheduling, who are sick and tired of having to wait until you know nine to five Monday through Friday and don't pick lunchtime and don't pick early in the morning, or do you think it's going to take um, a regulation from uh, ONC or CMS to mandate that that feature be? Um, included in um, the next version of the EHR tech, certified EHR technology, or uh, mandate that um, that providers um, uh, use it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very much on like a lot of these things require a mix of industry and policy to actually happen. I mean, some providers have are very happy to expose it. I mean, I personally in a, a health system have the ability to log in and select my provider's times. And so that provider has agreed to do that. Now, that was not the case where I lived, you know, two years ago. And so I think the mix of like technology and policy, this is an example where it's not just going to happen by providing patients asking for it. Because we've been, I mean, 
how long have we been, this is something I imagine we've all asked for a long time. Like, why do I have to call you to move my lab appointment four hours? This is crazy. And the person on the phone's like, I'm sorry, you know, like they're, they're very pleasant about it, but it's, 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 it's not something that, you know, I don't, I, I think I would say, I'll make a statement, make a strong statement that it's proven the market is not going to make this happen at this stage. And it should have at this point, because in every other aspect of our life, we are able to do this type of, I can schedule my guy who mows my lawn online because it's a business improvement for him. Um, well, let's move to question number four. That was a very good discussion. Thank you all. Uh, question number four says, how can the US CDI and US core best be leveraged to improve health equity? What other data standards, if any, do you deem essential in this area? Mel, I'll start with you. I don't know. I really struggle with this one. Um, I do think that one of the, the most helpful um, projects that's going to help in this area, and it is standards-based, is a National Directory of Healthcare Providers and Services. Um, CMS put out an RFI in December on this topic, and I know that um, the ONC FAST team or whatever it's now called, I think maybe it's been merged into DaVinci and they're working on um, the three standards uh, around it, the three implementation guides around um, a provider, uh, a national directory of um, provider uh, um, and, and payer uh, services. I believe that that is going to be helpful because once it gets populated, once it includes all the um, contact information for providers and social services, um, you know, where is the homeless shelter and how do you contact the, um, you know, the food banks? Um, I think that's going to, to um, be very helpful um, for folks at, at all levels of um, the, the income uh, um uh, spectrum. I, I'm not sure. I'd love to hear what other people think, and that might spur some additional thoughts in my mind. What other questions, what other thoughts do folks have before I, before I ask Brett? Janice, what about you? Well, um, I actually had a, I, I actually had a question. I, um, I was wondering about, there's such a focus on race and ethnicity, and for those of you who may not know, the OMB has just put out uh, by just, I mean, a couple of months ago, um, a significant a, a proposal for a significant update to race and ethnicity data standards. The current standards have been in place since I believe 1997, and it's a really radical change. One of which, one of the things they're looking to change is combining race and ethnicity into a single data point. And so I was, you know, when it comes to health equity, I think the OMB and CDC race and ethnicity standards are really important. And I was wondering if, if either of you had, had any thoughts on the impact of those proposed changes. Brett, you were smiling thing... when you heard that. I'm sorry, Mel. Go no, ahead. go ahead, Brett. Go ahead, Brett. Oh, I mean, I'm smiling because I also got a, you know, a call saying, like, what are we going to do about these, like, new, new codes that we've had out there? 20 years. I guess Janice, one, the way, so I'm going to, I don't, I'm not intentionally going to talk around it, but I just want to be clear. One of the things I'm always very careful of is like people like to not acknowledge historical data. Like it's really easy to say, let's design from here going forward. And so if there's a good business case for migrating to a new set of codes or concepts or technology, that's great. But let's think about like, what are we going to do with that historical data? Because if we don't, like we're missing a massive opportunity and potentially going to create kind of a, a bit more chaos. And so yeah. I don't know enough about the justification for the new concepts. I'm sure it was like, I'm sure they're very smart people and had very good reasons for it. Um, but I don't know quite the line from the kind of yeah. before to these before I can speak intelligently well, on it. Ba backwards compatibility in general has not been a priority in any of these standards or um, any of the stuff that that we're using, I pardon my voice, any of the stuff that we're we're starting to use in this area, that that's an area where everything can improve. <laughs> I want to just when when Melanie talked about like keeping track of provider directories, I'm curious, like, you know, you know, for for Bill Young or other folks who are responsible for health systems, how do you track, you know, when you have like an outreach to social services in your community? Like how, how do you how do you do that today? We're, a, we're benefiting from being a small community, right? So in general, we're on 
we share one medical record. We share one patient portal. So some of the some of the concepts you've talked about are po possibly better where I live in a small area. Um, we, we have started to build connections with these folks and started to share data. So we're just in the infancy of that. Um, but it, we've got a long way to go. And a lot of that's on health equity too, right? That we're trying to work with people that are not normally part of healthcare, food service, transportation, you know, people that help people in so many other ways outside of healthcare. So we take care of the whole patient. I don't think we've got it down to a science, but we, we've started bringing them together and just using, you know, SharePoint and other rude tools to just try to share data. And we've had some success. You know, I want to jump back to the last comment, just being a provider that's really tried to do good work. So we've been doing a lot of good work with trying to track many of these health equity standards, either using prior ways of doing it. And when the new ones show up, it's like, oh my God, I've got a lot of work now to kind of keep consistency across the data. And I, I think some, Brett said it or Janice or whatever, that we just don't keep that in mind all the time, right? Because people said, here's a new standard. All right, now I've got to take all the data that I've been trying to do for the last five years and keep it consistent over the next few until that data becomes too stale. Any other questions or thoughts on health equity? I mean, the comment about, you know, uh, engaging folks who may not get or may not or may have not traditionally gotten care. I think that's the one thing we talked about for, for me when I think about health equity standards is like, how do we engage folks where, you know, where they are, you know, if, it, if it's at that food bank to do the assessment there or at the community church or wherever they, wherever they're a spot to kind of get assessed, so they can get the proper services, like the, the technology is there, you know, it's just, it's making sure that once that is, once, once it's, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of technology to do some of these assessments, but, you know, the connection of what, you know, making sure they actually happen and then getting it passed along. There's just a lot of workflow points there that I think folks are starting to realize and, and spend some time on. And Brett, you're on, you're on a good thought there, just that we've been putting our toe in the water with trying to do that. And it's already showing great benefit, right? Go where the people are. We got we, we invested in a van, right? a little healthcare van that's going to come around the community and with partnering with our local FQHC. And, and it's just, again, the toe in the water, but it's the start and we're doing good things. Mel, you were I was just going to gonna bring up and and maybe this is a horrible place to close, but I'll just raise it. Um, I think I heard on the news last night that um, the administration is is proposing some new changes to the HIPAA laws that will help to uh, um, um, uh, help providers get braced for the new laws that are being p passed by some states about um, certain types of uh, medical care that is not allowed to be provi provided in that state and what happens if the patient crosses the state line to where it is legal to get gender affirming care or whatever care the patient needs is That's that right. provider in legal jeopardy because in the patient's home state that particular service is illegal so trying to pinpoint um, these data standards and get it just right and make sure that HIPAA and FTC or whatever the other um, uh, it, it places that regulate that, that data. Uh, OCR that put that out. Thank you, Janice. And was that yesterday that that came out? It was yesterday. It's a new It's a new uh, proposed rule from OCR that came out yesterday. For HIPAA, right? For HIPAA. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for, for, for new privacy standards around that data, yes. We're actually at time, but we encourage people to stay for another 30 minutes to continue this great conversation we're having. We already have a question queued up. Denny, um, if there's can any- Can I ask one more for, for, our, for our panelists before I, I'll try to hide. I've been talking a lot here, but this idea of health equity and maybe some of the changes that, that are coming, behavioral health, right? In our community, we, we have, and maybe every community, we got a lot of behavioral health issues that affect the overall care of people. And that data is required to be hidden, to be hidden away. What are your thoughts on changes there and, and what may be coming? This is just my personal belief and not anything that's grounded in things that I learned when I was at CMS. But as I watch the um, gun violence epidemic um, in the United States and I see the um, legislature at the federal level, at least being unwilling to make any kind of changes on the gun side, 
I believe that there are going to be changes on the mental health side to try to make more services available, to try to make more information available, to try to make it easier to spot um, people that may be struggling and, and may need some additional help. Um, so I believe that there are going to be um, more um, changes in the, the mental health world just from the, the gun perspective, but I believe there's probably lots of other avenues in the behavioral health side that are going to change as well. Yep. And Bill, there, there have actually been some RFIs and other signs that HHS is looking to loosen the current rules around the, the total protection of that data. There have been noises about them being part of certain interoperability rules and things like that. That would not be allowed with the current rules. Um, one thing that I did learn when I was at CMS was the notion of being for a patient to be able to give consent to have data released at the data element level instead of at the whole visit level. Or um, it, to, to me, it's, it sounds like there's a lot of work that's going to have to be done to try to figure out how do you assign consent to this diagnosis or this diagnosis or this phrase or this part of the visit. Um, I think that's gonna be challenging, but I think it's going to be um, really important as we move forward in the, in the mental health front. And I also think that, um, the, the um, National Directory for Healthcare Providers and Services is also going to be very helpful in the mental health space. I know that sometimes when I have had friends or family members who um, are at that crisis moment and they really need to make an appointment for the next day or the next hour, um, it's almost impossible because you have to start with, you know, well, what's your health insurance and what um, you know, who's in network and try to make phone calls and who's taking new patients. And it's almost impossible to get someone help fast. I hope that the National Directory for Healthcare Providers and Services will change that. I'm very optimistic that it will. We're just past the top of the hour and we look forward to, to continuing this conversation for the next 30 minutes. But I do want to, at this point, thank our guest experts, Melanie Combs Dyer and Brett Marquard for joining us today and lending us your expertise and insight. If you're able to stay for another 30 minutes, we'd be delighted. Uh, we are going to continue to have this conversation. Um, and let me share a little bit with folks uh, on the call about what's coming up for us. Um, on May 11th at 9 a.m., uh, we will be welcoming Ruby Rayleigh from Axway and Melanie, uh, I'm sorry, Marianne Yeager. Mel, I have your name imprinted in my brain. I'll get this right, I swear. Marianne Yeager, who is the CEO of the Sequoia Project. Uh, we're going to be talking about exchange standards and how important it is to create seamless exchanges that improve the patient experience. Um, Ruby is uh, the vice president at Axway. She is an API, a digital transformation expert. And she helps launch Axway's projects, improve processes, and position solutions. Uh, she has been a consultant advisory board member uh, for a number of years. Uh, Marianne leads the Sequoia Project, which is TEFCA, uh, and has more than 20 years of experience in the health IT field. She currently serves in that capacity at the Sequoia Project as CEO. And she leads the ONC TEFCA Recognized Coordinating Entity, or RCE helping ONC to develop and operationalize TEFCA. So we're looking forward to having everyone join us next month for part five of our interoperability, interoperability series uh, focused on exchange standards. Brett or Melanie, um, I, we don't want to impose upon your calendar, but we'd love you to stay. Uh, we're gonna put up a brief survey uh, for those of you who have been participating. Uh, please take a moment to fill it out when before you leave. Um, but let's continue our discussion. Yep. We've just touched on health equity. Janice, you were about to say something. Yeah, um, I actually wanted to follow up on something that Melanie just said. And then there's actually a comment that we got through, a question we got through Q&A that I told them we'd address during this portion of the meeting. So, um, but Melanie, you were just talking about more granular consents. I have not read the specifics of it. Um, because I did not speed read through all 556 pages of the ONC proposed rule. But one of the things that is supposedly in that rule is on the provider side, at least, having the ability to flag subsets, individual pieces of data that are part of USCDI as do not share, do not use further. 
I don't know anything about how they're structuring that. And there's obviously no analogous piece on the CMS side yet for the payer exchanges. So that's that that's a potential issue. But um, you know, so again, don't know that there was a one line thing in one of the six ONC overviews of the rule. So I don't know any of the details yet. I don't know anything about how it's structured and if it really does do that in a re reasonable way. But it is something that was outlined there. And it's something that we actually think is really important to have the patient have granular consent. People can do that on paper now. So not being able to do that when you do it electronically is going to um, deter some people from doing stuff electronically. So that, that's my two cents on that. I don't know if anyone has actually read that portion of the rule and has any further insight in that. If not, um, uh, we have a, an early question from Jason. And I don't know, Jason, if you'd like to unmute and ask it live. If not, we can ask it through. I'll ask it for you if you um, prefer. I Jason's, I think Jason's mic is open. Jason, do you have a question? Yeah, so I, I heard a lot of talk about, um, you know, patients as consumers um, and uh, about the standards and, and what elements are being added to the standards, which is, you know, really awesome. Um, but as a physician, we, um, you know, we just don't have a good way to exchange the data right now. So, you know, if, for example, I call up a physician at Bay State and I say, you know, I'd love you to send me your progress note there's just no way to do that or, or can you send me the labs um so the the ehrs just don't have user facing functionality to send this data um is there any work being done on that brett you want to go first on that um yeah i mean thanks for thanks for sharing that jason i mean it's 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 I, you know i'm just thinking what i know so jason you're at uh you're at Berkshire. Berkshire, Berkshire, right? And Bay State's on a Cerner. I, I'm assuming, I, I think Bay State's Cerner, if I remember correctly. They are, they are. They That's are. Right. I mean, what's hard, it's it's hard for me to like, we have all the key, it's, it's hard, like when you say that, it's like, I believe you and it's true and it's painful to hear because like there are the pieces to do that, right? Like every EHR has to support the direct exchange to send a direct transaction from one provider to another. And the ability to generate a progress note, also a required regulatory piece of their certified EHR that they have to be able to support. And so I immediately start to think, all right, so your request is reasonable. So like, let's, right, what's the two technical sides? Like why, why hasn't this happened? And I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is of like, maybe the configuration on each end hasn't been done in a way to enable that. Maybe it's not intuitive. Maybe there's not a network there. I don't, Full history of how those now like how those two organizations have worked together in the past, but it my immediate reaction is like that should be possible. This yeah. is Melanie, and I'll I'll tell you what um, is happening at the company that I now work for. Its name is Metal Solutions. I'm the director of innovation there, and they have Metal Solutions has developed a smart on fire app that sits in the EHR um, that the, the, can be used to, uh, request, a, a submit a prior authorization request to the payer. And, um, we, we also happen to run the server at Medicare fee for service, um, so that, um, uh, Medicare, original Medicare can receive those prior authorization requests, but it is a payer agnostic app. So it would work with any particular, um, payer that the patient had. And, um, one, issue that we have run into that that touches on what Jason's question was uh, has to do with um, in some of those situations where there is a prior authorization that is required, um, at least on, for original Medicare, the documentation comes from one provider, but the, the prior authorization request needs to be submitted by another provider. For example, um, in the home health space, it's the home health agency that is submitting the prior authorization request, but it is the ordering physician, the physician who orders the home health that um, has to document the right things in the medical record in order for the home health stay to be covered by original Medicare. And trying to figure out that um, mechanism for the providers to send from the ordering provider to the rendering provider and, and back again, 
um, is um, going to be a piece of what we have to work out as we try to um, uh, uh, make this, this um, Smart on Fire app actually work. It can't just be from the home health agency to the, the payer. It's got to be from the ordering provider to the rendering provider to the payer. And so my guess is that if we see any movement in the provider to provider space, it's going to start with those things that um, require an order for prior authorization or require some documentation um, from a different provider to be included in the prior authorization request. But I really like your idea, um, Jason, and, and I'll try to raise it with some of my friends at CMS when I see them next week at HIMSS. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like your cell phone analogy earlier where, you know, an AT&T customer couldn't call a Verizon customer. Um, until the regulations required that, or, or you know, maybe there was some business sense to that too. Um, if I have to call my IT person to send a CCD uh, to another physician, and if they have to call their I, their IT person to rely on it. that, it's it's not really yeah. great. It'd be kind of like if I had to call AT and T and say, "Hey, I'd like to call a Verizon customer now." Yes. Um, in fact, you remind me of the words that are in the ONC um, regulation around providers and patients, where I think it talks about the information has to be made available without special effort. And I think that's a great term to use. I think people understand sort of generally what that means, um, but it would be nice if that were to be expanded to provider to provider communication so that that too could be without special effort. Bill Young, you look like you're on the. You have something to add to this. We're talking about your system. We're talking about your your exchange with your companion hospital in Springfield. What are your thoughts? Well, re real quick, I, I Dr. Tui. So I'm blessed. Uh, Dr. Tui is one of my CMOs. I'm blessed to have two of them. Um, so I'm, I I have to say thank you, and I have to jump off. So Melanie and Brett, this has been great. I did want to say that I think Berkshire could be a, a pretty cool test case that we, we'd love to partner with both of you somehow that I think we'd love to figure out how even just with Bay State with Cerner and Meditech, how can we make some of these things really happen? You guys have been great. This has been a great discussion. I apologize. I have to leave. Dr. Tui, I don't know if you can stick around, but this has been a great discussion. I just wanted to say thank you. Right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill Young. Yeah. And I will ask um, Denny or Janice to send an email that connects um, Brett and me to um, Bill Young. I would love to take him up on his offer of yeah. trying to um, do some kind of a pilot or explore some kind of a solution that could be developed, um, at I least think... in the sandbox, and perhaps oh, taken yeah. to CMS and ONC to say, go, do your it. Use case, your use case on, on you know trying to get um, visiting nurse and doctors connected. We have that happening. It's even in my own system with my own EMRs. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I, you know, we, we'd certainly be happy to help people connect with each other. The um, To add further to the answer to the question, I think there's a couple of components in play that will help. First of all, at the end of 2022, the fire require the requirements for full fire support at USCDI one level in certified health technology came into play. And so we will start seeing more ability to do um, all kinds of fire related connectivity on the provider side based on that requirement. Not everyone's going to be compliant right away, et cetera, but that should be an improvement. Um, in addition, the, some of the new stuff, this is not, not immediate, but some of the new stuff that's being proposed, there's sort of this, it, it won't help with the particular use case that Melanie talked about, but there is a, a sense that the, the payer is going to become more and more the sort of the circulator of record for patient data. And if you look at the CMS rules, um, you know, there's a provider access API that's coming up where the payer, there's sort of a model of going from provider to payer to provider that, that may be a little bit more circular, but but in theory, once that rule's in effect, which again isn't yet, um, you should be able to get every piece of data that the payer has. So that would help a lot with all of these situations, I'm not, you know, you should still be able to talk provider to provider. I'm not suggesting that that's not something you should be able to do, but there are mechanisms in place. And one of the advantages, I think one of the ways that 
CM, this is this is sort of same as view where the payer is the center of the world. And I think one of the thoughts there is because you may not even know half of the providers that the patient has or where some of the data that's relevant to what you're trying to do lives. So if you request it from the payer and they have all of the data, you can get that data. And presumably in theory, and hopefully there will be provenance there so you know exactly where the data actually originated. And so that's this is a long-winded answer and it's off in the future a little bit, but hopefully that's that's a way where this will improve. But there still should be direct provider to provider um, interactions. And that should in fact, in theory, be feasible with the requirement that went into place at the end of 2022. Doesn't help you now and it doesn't help if it's not actually working for you, but but in theory, that's that's what should start start taking place. And Jason, keep asking that question though, like over and like why. It's, it's such a reasonable question to ask. Like, why can't I get the progress note from the place down the street? Like, it because it it takes work to get those connections set up, but the technology is there. Like, we spent a lot of time in the last ten years on it, and it's. I know there may be. I know there's complexity there. I know there's sometimes pieces in between, and there's policies. And, there's all kinds of things that make it hard. But like, it it is technically possible, and health systems all over the country do do exactly what you just described. Doctor Tui, could you give us a priority list of the if if you were in charge? And you could set the regulations. Um, would you start with things that have to be prior authorized, or which types of providers are you having most difficulty with, or do you wish um, you could contact and hear back from without special effort? Well, I mean, it, you know, just whenever you have a patient who goes to another system that's not in in the EHR, it's a whole, it's a major effort to get any of the data. Um, you know, we our oncologists actually just recently approached me. We have patients who uh, live in northern Massachusetts and actually get their blood work drawn in Vermont, for example, um, and they wanted that blood work and there really isn't a mechanism to, to do it. I mean, and, the, and again, the standards are there as, as far as I'm aware, but um, it's just not easy without setting up a whole interface with the lab and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's so it's it's just it's I'm hopeful that the as you said the technology is going to be there soon and with the regulations. But right now, what I would love to do is right from within my you know I'm viewing a progress note. I'd love to be able to click send this to another physician, enter their direct address, and boom, they get it. Um, and, and you know the other thing is we we're connected to the Commonwealth network, um, which is good. It's kind of been a double-edged sword. Uh, we've had some patients where when we query the Commonwealth network, we get 200 CCDs in from, and many of them are from little urgent care visits that really have almost no useful data in them. Um, and even some from some bigger hospitals and sites, the CCDs are, it's like demographics data and that's it. Um, there really is almost no good clinical data. Uh, so, yeah, just the ability to read another physician's progress note easily would be huge. Next week is HIMSS, and I have been invited to participate in a CMS listening session. I think ONC will be there as well, but I think it's being hosted by CMS, the, um, the office that puts out the interoperability rules. And they um, are focusing on long-term post-acute care. So, Dr. Tui, the que this question is for you. Can you think about... Um, when your patient is being discharged from the hospital, maybe going to a SNF, maybe they're going to a home health agency, or maybe they're going home um, with some durable medical equipment. In, in that context, um, how do you communicate with the SNF, the HHA, and the DME supplier, or are you back to faxes and telephones? Um, honestly, mostly faxes and telephones. We... Um... We do, our, our EHR does have the capability to send CCDs at discharge. Um, and we're actually making use of that. Um, on the other side though, the SNFs, their, their EHR uh, will receive the CCD, but the, it's, from what they've told me, there's a lot of effort to get that actually associated with the patient chart. Um, yeah. So, you, you know, that's sort of working, but if there's no IT resource available to sniff, they we just don't, aren't really able to do it. So we're still relying on paper to get 
things like I that. Have a, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you were done. Please finish your thought. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was basically, we're, we're just relying on paper for discharge summaries and medication lists. Thank you, Dr. Tui. Yep. So I, I actually had a follow up because I think this is an important piece of the same question. When you do get data from someone, are you integrating it into your records or are you putting it off in a silo of this is stuff that came in via some file? Because part of the part of the problem with with some of what's happened in the past is that the data that you do that people do get in don't become part of the patient's records. So when there's additional exchange or any of these models that are being built data that did not originate from that organization doesn't get passed on and then it may no longer the patient doesn't necessarily know that or they may have assumed they've moved their records if it was a record move for a new doctor or something and so I think a piece of this puzzle if we wanted to solve it for the types of use cases that you're talking about um, on an ongoing basis is also you know, when you do get data and when you do make, when, when this process does work and hopefully it will work more and more frequently as we move forward, is the data that you're getting in being integrated in with the record? And I know that you're not on the IT side, so it may not be fair to ask you, but that, that I think that's, you know, when you do have these discussions with people on, on your side, can we make, you know, how can we do this? Can we make it easier? I think that's an important piece of it too, making sure that that, that data that you do get isn't shunted off and not and just sort of left off on the side when when you send data to people or when you when you respond to requests. Yeah, so the most common way we're receiving data right now is via Commonwealth. Um, and you know, again, some of the patients we get just a million CCDs, and it's almost impossible to parse through what's important. And and honestly, our EHR does a poor job of displaying the data and allowing us to filter it, uh, displaying the CCDs and allowing us to filter it. Um, but if I do have a patient and I notice that there's CCDs from Commonwealth and there's only a few of them, uh, I'll go through them and I actually will pull them into the record. Um, the, and sometimes there's really good data. So, you know, every so often we'll get a CAT scan report or an x-ray report or uh, an assessment and plan from a physician, which is really useful um, or lab data that we don't have in our system. Um, and so I do pull that into the patient's record and then it is available forever. Um, but our EHR also doesn't really do anything with that discreetly. So if the patient has a CBC and that CCD, it doesn't go to the lab section of the EHR. So I, you know, for future, someone has to know that there's lab data within right. that CCD to actually go in and view it. Um, for the most part, they're going to be looking at the patient's white count on the lab section of the EHR, they're not going to say, "Oh, well, let me go see if there's CCDs with lab data." Right, and then that, and yeah. that's a manual process as well. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, Mel. I have a question. Actually, I maybe I'll just call it a suggestion for. Um, I'm not sure if this is for um, Dave Delano or if this is for Denny, um, but it's for somebody, <laughs> in, or maybe it's for you, Janice, um, at MHDC. Um, I really think that trying to pull together a document that lays out some of the um, things that um, Dr. Tui has on his wish list um, um, and, and actually trying to um, develop an implementation guide, a fire implementation guide, either going to the DaVinci team and asking them to develop it or perhaps figuring out a way that Massachusetts um, Health Data Collaborative can um, um, uh, pull the funds together to develop that implementation guide on its own and then submit that to, um, you know, through the normal balloting process at HL7 and work with CMS and ONC to see if, if one or both of them can put it into their regulation, either to require it in EHRs or to encourage um, um, providers to use it um, if they want to get their meaningful use money. I think that would be something that MHDC could take the lead on and maybe Brett and I could, could, and Dr. Tui and others on this call could help with. That's an excellent suggestion. Yeah. Thank you, Mel. Yeah, and I would be more than happy to participate. Thank Great. you, Dr. Tui. Yeah. We may take you up on that. Yeah, so I, I will, uh, th th I'll follow up with folks that that's definitely probably something that would fall under my bailiwick if we went in that direction. Perfect. Well, if you can just first get us connected by email, maybe we can start yep. some kind of conversation that yeah, let's way. Let's stop percolating that. Let's get that. <laughs> let's start. Yeah, see what it. we can stew up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And, and Melanie, be careful about talking about my wish list. It's a mile long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you actually we've got a great combination of me with my history at CMS and Brett with his understanding of ONC and. 
um, we may be able to go through your wish list and sort of figure out which ones we think um, the government would be more um, open to. And I think if we can then figure out how to get an implementation guide developed and tested, that's when CMS or OMC may be able to um, actually adopt them and, and call them out as um, required in a, in a rule. So I think it's very exciting. I'm so glad that um, MHCC has pulled us all together for this forum, for this conversation. And I'm looking forward to the, the follow on that may come. So are we. So are we. Yes. Dave well, Delano, you popped up on the screen. Did you have something you wanted to add to this conversation? Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> lots. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I've been trying to boil it down and think of some things that you know we could all do collectively to move the dial forward. Um, certainly as Dennis points out, the fire exchange standards will help. And we think APIs are, you know, certainly going to help with some of this data integration stuff. Um, we didn't really touch much on the regulatory side in terms of legal exchange of records and all of that. And I think there is some friction still in the market around that. We did talk about a little bit with the behavioral health data and the part two HIPAA data, but um, TEFCA is the other thing that didn't come up today either. Which I'll just mention because you know there may be some opportunities through TEFCA to improve on some of these clinical data exchange provider to provider exchange mechanisms in the future. Uh, not sure yet. I think it's still the jury's out on that. Um, but the Argonaut project, I think uh, Brett knows, started with us at the Massey Health Collaborative and Mickey Therapathy and all of that. Uh, and the goal there really was to figure out what these specific clinical exchange use cases are and then how to improve on those and care quality. We mentioned care quality and care anywhere. And those have been sort of vendor specific solutions to solve some of those problems, but they haven't really been industry wide, you know, solutions for every HR and every payer, or every provider either. So there's a, all these pieces that just need to coalesce together into the sort of the plan going forward. And I think with all the different SDOs, standards development organizations and different you know, sort of facets of interest around this, we're still fragmented as an industry. And we're fragmented around all of those various, you know, sort of standards being developed and meth mechanisms, no, you know, no ill intent by anyone. Everybody's trying to solve the same problems, but we're not coordinated enough yet. We still have different standards, different, mo you know, somebody mentioned X12, somebody mentioned fire, somebody mentioned other methods. So it's all got to come together somewhere, somehow. <laughs> as an industry so that we can uh, move all this forward together. That's my opinion anyway. <laughs> it's, it's a big task. Yeah. Brett, what are you thinking? You, you're, I, you're got not a lot, I got a lot on my mind in <laughs> two minutes. I mean, Dr. <laughs> Tui, I would say, keep asking, keep asking. You're asking the most reasonable questions. Like, why can't I do this? Why can't I do this? I know it's frustrating. I was at UMass Amherst. And like I couldn't get my lab to my clinician on the street, so I stopped going to UMass lab. I went somewhere else. And like telling that, hey UMass, you're losing money because you don't have this interface. I don't know. They're not going to change. But anyway, keep keep asking. And David, in terms of these tech, some of this stuff is you're right. We're not. There's no ill intent in a lot of this. It's like we. It's just there's a lot of priorities in different directions. There's one technology we've played with a little bit. You know, you hear like smart health or like, sorry, you're verifiable vaccine credential for those who, you know, you got vaccinated, you had that, that barcode. We did do a project last year and did some experimentation. I think this has a ton of possibility called smart health links. So instead of when you scan that barcode, it's all embedded in there to say, hey, you have a verified vaccine. That actually is a link to your EHR to then, or link to your, your, P, your personal health record, link to wherever you'd like it to be to then extract and download that data. And where I think like Dr. Tui's use case is like, hey, I have this lab result, Quest or LabCorp or whatever that reference lab is, here's the, here's the smart health barcode to then be able to scan that and then extract and save that directly from there, cuts out all kinds of this complexity, like I've authorized it. Anyway, that's something that we've experimented with, you know, you know uh, Boston oh. Children's and other folks, and I'm excited about. Yeah, no, well, this, I, I totally agree with that. Let me just chime in one more quick thing, Danny, sure which did. is that, um, you know, the sort of the, you know, the, the, the notion that there are all these different sort of competing efforts, if we will, to solve the same problems. Um, the, you know, there is this now new 
push at the standards development and at the regulatory level and, and CMS ONC and, and CVHS and others to do this thing called Convergence 2.0. I don't know if anybody's been aware of this, but essentially the idea is that all of these various standards, developments and capabilities, they need to converge. We need to converge on use cases and around the specific needs of the healthcare industry so that we're not all you know, like, oh, our solution is the best. Let's do this, or you know, and and that that you know, ongoing sort of competition. And there is some competition there because everybody wants their solution to be the best uh, and be the one that's selected. But at the end of the day, we've got to get you know back to neutral and say what's best for patient care, what's best for delivery, what's best for health systems, you know, payers, providers, as well as individuals. And those are the things we need to solve. You know, it isn't. You know, having the best whiz bang smart on fire app on the in the world that's going to solve the problem. But you know, there are uh, lots of energy. There's lots of energy to give Dr. Tui a little bit of you know, sort of hope here. There is a lot of energy moving forward around converging all these various standards and methods and regulations so that we're at least coordinated going forward with advancements around interoperability and exchange that should help. <laughs> May not help immediately, but it should help in the longer run. Well, we're at the bottom of the hour, Mel, Brett. This has been great. We have, we're we're stimulating for the discussion, which is really what we want to do in this forum. This has been uh, the best session we've had to date. Uh, your engagement and enthusiasm for what you do and what you do that helps our health system is infectious in the best possible sense. It's a dangerous word to use these days, <laughs> um, but. We really appreciate your joining us today and, and shedding some light on data standards and what they mean and what they can do and how they can help clinicians and patients uh, get the work done that has to be done. Uh, I want to also thank, you know, Jason, you for joining us. I want to thank all of our guests and our colleagues. Uh, we will have this recording available and we will also have um, organized a follow-up to this discussion as soon as we exchange our emails and begin talking about this. So with that, thank you everyone for joining us and for joining our interoperability session. There will be a survey that pops up when you leave. Please take a moment to fill it out. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank, thank you, you everyone. So thank, you. thank you all.